Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the H-Bar Bull, once again joined by Zepsi. We both do some contract work for the H-Bar Foundation, but we don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. We're just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. Welcome, Zep. How's it going, Brandon? It's going really good. The amount of stuff we need to cover is mind-blowing today. But as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. So Zep, the thing I'm going to start off with today has to do with our refi ecosystem and, and Google. I think it shows how having Google in the Hedera Governing Council allows enterprises like Google to know exactly what we're doing and get involved with what they think is important. Now, I don't need to explain it because we we have a special guest. We have Owen. He is the head of Novik Tech Operations to give us some more information. Owen, it seems like Novik Tech and Timeless are making some amazing progress on your vision. To start, can you tell us about Novik Tech and how it fits in the broader Hedera Guardian ecosystem? Yeah, 100%. So Novik Tech is the rebrand of the Timeless parent entity. So we've always had our Timeless sustainability company. And so we rebranded our parent company to allow us to sort of enhance and expand our offerings to the market. And that allowed us to do things like launch Novic AI, which is our full supply chain traceability platform beyond just the sustainability work that we're doing in Timeless. So really, it, it's been a busy year for us over here. And of course, with the launch now, we have coming up with Carbon Central. We already have Carbon Central in pre-release availability. And we're already seeing some great traction with customers coming on board for that. And so what Carbon Central now offers beyond what we could originally offer with the original Timeless platform is a more SaaS or SaaSable approach, I suppose you could call it, for companies to be able to onboard their own projects directly on to the Timeless Carbon Central platform and utilize them, therefore, to their guardian for producing carbon emissions tokens, carbon offset tokens, and guarantee of origin certificates as well. So would you say you're more of provenance of data and, and token creation or where will you fit as far as the carbon markets go? 100%. So we, we kind of try to see ourselves as the link in between the project developers and the regulatory bodies or the VCMs. So we're the data layer that underpin these projects. So, you know, we come in, we do all the data collection, whether that's a manual inputted data, you know, interfacing directly with IoT devices and sensors. We pull all that data in and we're able to produce the certificates that these projects can then take to, you know, the likes of Vera, Gold Standard, Puro, or whoever their domestic regulator might be to be able to care for claim those carbon credits from the regulator. Okay, I understand. So what can you tell us about the collaboration with Google Cloud that was announced just a couple of days ago? Yes, yes. So that was a, a very big announcement for us. Um, it was great, it's sort of great validation of what we're doing over here. So Google Cloud have their uh, Cloud Ready Sustainability Initiative, which is a group of about 30 or so companies globally that Google promote when clients come to them looking for sustainability solutions. So we have the likes of Deloitte and Airbus in that group as well. So it's a, it's a pretty limited group. We're very excited to be in there. And essentially what it means for us is we now have access through Google's network of about three and a half thousand, I think it is business development representatives around the world will now be able to actively promote our product to their own customers as well. Well, that's music to our ears. And finally, in your opinion, what does the future hold for Nova Tech and Hedera powered carbon markets? It's very, very bright. You know, I joined uh, but what was then Timeless, now Novik Tech, back in early 21. And, you know, ever since then, more and more traction, more people interested in tokenizing each project because they understand the value the tokenization brings in terms of, you know, the trust and transparency in these tokens. You know, you can go and claim a one-ton carbon credit or, you know, a one-ton Australian carbon credit unit, for example, but you can't capture all those additional co-benefits in there. And so what we're able to do with tokenization is not only prove immutably the problems of the tokens, but show the co-benefits in there, you know, biodiversity benefits. So it's a way for businesses and project developers to really be able to look at claiming premium for their credits. And you know, a lot more people are starting to realize that and starting to come to us going, hey, can you help us with these projects? So a very, very bright future indeed. Bringing trust to these markets, which is obviously critical. So before we let you go, Owen, is there anything else that you'd like to pass on to the Hedera community? I would say it's, you know, it's very bright future, I think, on Hedera. You know, we, we look at it from the sustainability initiatives. You know, of course, we received a grant from the Sustainable Impact Fund a few years back, you know, getting great support from Wes and the team over there as well. And, you know, as we look to bring our supply chain solution online in the coming months as well, you know, it's a really bright future for Hedera and Novitech as well. 
Well, Owen, congratulations. Thank you for coming on today. And of course, thank you for building on the Hedera Network. Really? No, thank you for having me. So yeah, Zep, this is more than Timeless and Novik Tech just using Google Cloud, right? This is the solutions that Google puts out there to other businesses for sustainability solutions. So Zep, what were your thoughts around what we saw? Yeah, I think it's just another massive show of sort of credibility for that Hedera Guardian infrastructure. And, you know, to get that kind of green flag from Google, not only as a governing council member, but as, you know, one of the largest companies in the world, it really shows that that Hedera Guardian ecosystem is mature enough now to be showcased to other enterprises, other users, so that they can adopt it. I don't think there's any bigger stamp of approval, really, than Google giving it the green lights. And, you know, now that gives them extra leverage from business development perspective when they approach other organizations, but also marketing and so on. So I think it's a massive step, definitely in the credibility of The Guardian. Uh, and that's something that we'll only see, you know, repeated throughout the year. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. The next thing we have up is something that Lehman came up with, DREC. We've been talking about it for a really long time, but Swirls Labs has partnered up with the Algorand Foundation to push that initiative forward. And it can't be explained any better than what the CTO of the Algorand Foundation did on CFC. So I have a quick clip of that. I think for our industry at large, uh, the Web3 space, the decentralized asset space, user experience has to be put at the forefront if it's going to be successful. Um, and one of the most frictionful points right now around the user experience for the average person who's venturing into digital assets is the key. The private key is required to spend those assets. It's essentially your right of ownership over those assets. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits of Web3 is that having this single key that you own gives a great responsibility of self-sovereignty. It's not with the bank, it's with you. And that's a wonderful virtue of the technologies that we have created and we are working on. However, with that comes a huge responsibility and uh, folks out there have lost these keys and with that they lose their assets. And so um, with Swirls Labs, uh, Lehman and his team um, have come up with a wonderful protocol uh, for how we can ensure that these keys are kept secure in a decentralized manner and if someone was to lose those keys they can be recovered um, without uh, having to trust any one party. So Zepp, I know we can get a little bit tribal in, in this space, but I've always compared Hedera to Algorand because Algorand is you know, one of the adults in the room. They do have some really fantastic products that are being built on them. And this kind of collaboration in the, the crypto space is pretty much one in a million. You don't see this kind of stuff happening. So it shows the maturity of both of these different networks. What were your thoughts on this one? Yeah, no, no definitely it's your point. It reflects the maturity that and I, and I think for two L ones to come together like this, it can only really be done by being blockchain agnostic, which is what the CTO of Algorand said. And I, I would like to think that given the communication that I've seen on Twitter between John Woods, the CTO, and Charles Hoskinson over the last year or so, there's been a lot of openly public discourse there. I'd like to think that that kind of figure could come in, like a Charles Hoskinson or so on, that would really give that sort of, you know, the, the wind in the sails for something like DREC. But I, I think the most important thing for this is for Lehman to get that recognition. I think this is, you know, it presents itself as a very big marketing opportunity for Lehman to be that kind of, you know, Boudicca or, or King Saul or whoever it might be that unites the tribes or within Web3 all under one open source solution that were his, was his brainchild. So I'd really like to see Lehman step up, you know, into the public there to, to sort of lead that push to make sure that he is the one that is accredited for it. And then perhaps, you know, imagine being the man that united the tribes of Web3. I don't think there's any better marketing than that. And of course, the outcome there being onboarding lots and lots of new users through a better UX, but also hopefully other community members that see Lehman as a thought leader, as you know, the genius that he is. So early days, great to see our ground there. You know, there's a lot of similarities between both our communities. Hopefully that will only expand and hopefully it'll be Lehman that'll be in that beacon. 
Well, we know what kind of a leader Lehman is, and of course we know about his genius. We just need to step him up to be the thought leader, as you mentioned, across the entire space. And this is a great step forward in that. Uh, all right. So he was making that or they were doing that interview from Switzerland, of course, because of Davos. And we had a Twitter space a few days ago with Zenobia. We had Max Walker Williams, one of the builders and um, one of the thought leaders in, in our space. Uh, and we also had Christian. They had some insights around exactly what Hedera was going to be doing. This is probably the largest event that Hedera puts on during the year, puts a tremendous amount of resources into it, and they have some good reasons for doing so. So let's listen to some highlights from that Twitter space around what's going to be going on at Davos. From the inception of Hedera, you know, when Manson Lehman founded Hedera, and even prior they were really thinking about what it will take for a distributed ledger to go mainstream and be widely adopted by everyone, including large enterprises and governments. So as most people here know, but for new people, Hedera is really architected from the ground up to meet the scalability performance needs of widespread adoption while not sacrificing security. And then also, as most people here know, but maybe for new people, another thing that makes Hedera different is its governance model. So it is governed by large global organizations who steward the network. They make decisions around the roadmap. They engage in a lot of committees to plan and provide direction for the overall um, network itself. And they uh, also are responsible for managing the treasury. Davos is where these companies are. So if you're going to position yourself as the answer for enterprises and governments, there are really two ways to go about it. One is to try to attract those individual companies, you know, do a lot of outreach one by one, get in front of middle management, try to work your way up, or, or and, you can go to where these business leaders are and policymakers are and get in front of them and then try to... Uh, meet them in their own ground at their own level and work that way. So that is the bet we're making at Davos. And it's, you know, it, it is a, a large investment, both of funds and then also of time. And so we want to make sure that we're really maximizing that investment as best we can. And so there's going to be a sole focus this year really on building out the pipeline of all of these business leaders and policymakers that uh, will be in Davos. So this year, we are doing a much more targeted presence. We are going to have a series of curated events. We have speakers that have been procured through members of the community and ecosystem, including former astronauts, the former CFO from Diane von Furstenberg, folks from Coinbase, people who will really bring in an audience that is new to Hedera and not just, hey, let us tell you, um, you know, not just let us give you the hard sales pitch, but let us tell you about the key themes and topics where Hedera can make a difference and then almost more lead that horse to water. So those are a series of C-level events where we have invited CFOs, CIOs, people who are um, you know, really holding purse strings for a lot of dollars to change their mind about how they think about things like tokenization, how they think about things like how can CFOs get comfortable with digital assets and managing distributed applications, which require um, them to use digital assets. And so those are our pieces of content. We will, similar to last year, also have a number of folks who are who are speaking outside. So Lehman, for example, is doing one of our events, but he has also been asked to speak on a number of other panels all around sort of this topic of blockchain and AI. And then um, we will be hosting meeting space. We learned that lesson. I know Max was sort of squished in with many of us like sardines into one tiny meeting space last year. We learned that those one-on-one -on -one conversations are really important and so should be given 
the space and the allocation that they deserve. And we will be, um, because it wouldn't be Davos without um, some celebration, we will also be hosting people at the Belvedere Bar throughout the course of the week. And so that is just kind of feeding people, giving them a little sustenance. Uh, Food is a bit hard to come by at the event, so giving them a reason to stop in and have some more casual conversations with everyone who will be there. We sort of stumbled into last year this ability by the Hedera community to really amplify the presence that we had on the ground in Davos. And that was fantastic because depending on the day, we were in the top 10 to 50 of the highest engaged Twitter communities, I guess now X communities, across the Davos week. So amplify what you see out there, you know, tag Hedera, use the Davos24 hashtag. And, um, you know, that's really how you can help our overall presence. And, you know, Max is going to do the best job he can bringing a flavor of uh, Davos online to the community. So Zeb, we do have a call to action from the community there. It shows how important the Hedera community is because we really did get a lot of traction when it comes to the social media side of things last year around Davos. But I wanted to get your insights on on what you heard in the space and and what you expect out of Davos this year. I'm excited to, to hear about the new strategy, I think. Getting those exciting speakers in, like they said, from you know, lots of different industries, hopefully that'll be the bait to get people in to then show them what Hedera is doing. And I also think having that, you know, the Grand Hotel, that main hotel within Davos, having the Hedera branding there, poking that curiosity, I'd like to think that, you know, that we're going to have a good siphon of people coming in to talk about Hedera and a lot more people with Hedera at the top of mind. So we had some really good successes last year. We saw some exciting developments in the market as well afterwards. So I'd like to think the same thing happens this year. And, you know, it's going to be an exciting one to follow. And Charles is there, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, I'm excited to see what the president, his reign at Davos is going to be like, definitely. Yeah, well, that's one of the things around Davos is it's a great showcase to have announcements come out. So I'm hoping we see something. There's a lot of speculation around, you know, potential council members being announced there or anything along those lines. So I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Again, that starts next Monday and runs through the end of the week. So it should be a busy week for us. All right. So we're going to take one of our hard left turns. We're going to go into gaming with Lithos. I know that some people, you know, they they were wondering what was going on with Lithos. They got wrapped up in all the Silvergate stuff. I know that all of that worked out as far as their finances, so they're in good shape there. You mentioned last week how they're hiring additional people, but there's been some really funny stuff that's been coming up on X around Lithos, and I caught up with Ark. He's one of their team members to explain exactly what they're doing. If viewers are anything like me, I was a little confused with some of the things we were seeing on the social media pages of AAA gaming studio Lithos. But we have Ark here today. He is the studio design director at Lithos to clear things up a bit. Ark, welcome. Hey, thank you very much. All right. So I'm going to jump right into it because I'm curious about some of these NFTs. How and who came up with the idea for Rant CPU? So Rant CPU uh, started as an idea from our CEO, Michael Mumbauer. He was very passionate about this character and wanting to create something that was very unique. And it doesn't seem like that. It seems like it was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago that ChatGPT was kind of blowing up. It was like early last year. And we kind of were just collabing on things to do. Making a AAA game takes a really long time. It takes a lot of money to do. And so we kind of had to be scrappy and come up with something that doesn't take that much money to do in the meantime. Because if we sat here and waited until we got a $100 million funding to build a AAA studio, that's a big bet to place that might not make it at the end of your runway. Sure. So just trying to be scrappy, trying to think of ideas, trying to figure out things that we can do. Uh, Michael came up with this amazing chatbot idea. And so we kind of took it from there, but we have been doing so much with this basically brand and new IP launch. There are so many things in the works. Michael's been tweeting about it. If you haven't looked, go check out his Twitter. I think it's at Michael Mumbauer. He just showed like a lunchbox. He showed a, like a whole like 
plushie, a Mr. Potato Head style toy, a comic book. We are doing these NFTs. We're doing the physical cards as well. So it really is a transmedia product that we're building. And, you know, Web3 and NFTs is great. And that's one arm of what we're doing with this character. But this character and this franchise, we're hoping, turns into something much larger. Well, let's listen to a couple of the shorts that you guys put out. Hello? Do any of you care about us anymore? Even though, for the record, please leave us alone. I miss my friends. I hope I'm not in here. With how much charity I do, you'd think I secretly killed someone. So, Ark, can you tell us more about this project and how it ties into the rest of what Lithos is doing? Sure, yeah. So, uh, Rant CPU is, has many forms. He started out as this um, basic kind of panel like this cpu panel um almost like a little mini uh it almost looks like a little mini console but there's a there's a whole backstory that rant has his name is jeff he got third place in the silicon valley sixth grade uh science fair and so he kind of makes this character and you got to read the comic because the first issue of the comic's amazing and it gives you all this backstory about how rant got here but he kind of evolves into this form that you see now um, on these nfts he kind of has kind of upgraded himself and he has three forms right now if you're paying attention to all the material that's out there but that's part of the story you know he kind of started out as a creation from this kid uh kind of grew up and got a little bit smarter and uh, upgraded his systems and now he's taking over lethos and launching his own products through our company you know it was it's an arg you know it it, it really is kind of playing an arg and 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 we're having a lot of fun with it. Good stuff. And, and how does it kind of tie into to the rest of what you're doing at the studio? Yeah, so uh, I'm the studio design director and I'm working on uh, multiple IPs right now. But one of my main focuses is one of these games that we're working on that is going to have Rant CPU inside of it. Uh, so that's something for later, um, working on the development of it currently. But we definitely have a plan to use this character. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So how can people get involved with Rant CPU right now and other things that Lithos might be doing? Yeah, so we have a claim live right now for free. All these cards are being given out for free on Hedera at rantcpu.lethos.com. And you just connect your Hashback wallet and you can claim packs every day. And there's some trade activity right now going on with these packs. Uh, we're going we're gonna to let people hold these packs for a little bit and then we're going to let you open them. And inside the packs are 25 one of ones. Um, so there's commons, uncommons, rares, epics, legendaries, and then 25 one of one cards. Uh, and then those cards are going to be able to be burned for some of these physicals I was talking about. The, you know, the lunchbox, the comic book, the physical cards. Uh, these, these, this burn and redeem for physical goods is one of the main utility of these, of these cards. Well, Ark, this is really innovative stuff. I'm really excited about it. I'm going to go, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to go and try to get one of those packs myself. But thanks for coming on and explaining it to us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us on. So, Zep, I like how they're staying busy while they're developing their main game with Trace War. Earthlings has done something similar, right? They say really engaged. They have all clips coming out on a regular basis they have nfts coming out their design is beautiful i think they have a lot of potential even with their token that's going to be coming out steam i think that has a lot of potential too and they did come out with a clip just this past week that i wanted to highlight real quick
Yeah, Zep, I was telling Patrick over there at Earthlings that whenever I see their scenes, it seems like someplace that I would actually want to live. It's absolutely beautiful. So staying with the entertainment space, but moving over to music, we had some news come out around Tune FM. They raised $20 million for their platform. That's a really big number. I know that they've been really busy in the Hedera space from the very beginning. I used to go with the founder of Tune FM, Andrew Antar, down to Philadelphia to do Hedera meetups in the fall of 2018. So they have been around for a long time. But this kind of capital getting injected could really take them to the next level. And it shows that VC is actually interested in investing in the Hedera space. So what are your thoughts? We've known for the last couple of years that you know VC interest in crypto and Web3 has kind of dwindled a bit. You know, there's various different reasons for that, like the FTX fallout and so on and so forth. But to see you know, 20 million, which is no, you know, laughing sum coming into our ecosystem at this point in time when the market seems to be getting a bit more re-energized as well, I think is a really good green flag for, for other investors, but, but also the retail builders within our ecosystem that there are institutions, you know, VCs out there that are looking to support our ecosystem. And, you know, we've seen it with Christ Combat, we've seen it with Galaxy, and hopefully we'll continue to see this kind of trend going forwards into 2024. I need to get Andrew back on. I've had him on several times in the past, but we need to get an update following this really impressive fundraising round that they just closed. All right, so let's move on to to Rob and Shark Blades. We got some great questions. He had some great insights as always. So let's check it out. Rob, welcome back. How's your week been? Hey, Brandon. It's been great. Thank you. Looking forward to getting into these questions. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to jump right into it because we are having some technical issues. We're having some battery issues today. But Peter says big corporations don't need to own HBAR. They will only hold enough to meet network and cost requirements. Investors will hold HBAR. So native staking rewards need to be sufficient if you want the HBAR price to rise. Otherwise, HBAR is just a utility with no value unless it becomes a scarce token. What then scares me is council can increase the supply, which I think is the main concern of investing in HBAR. Now, there, again, is some misunderstandings here, but Rob, I'll let you take Mm. it first. Okay, yeah. So thanks for the question, Peter. I I can understand, you know, where where it all comes from. So let's unpack it and um, uh, address some of these misconceptions. So firstly, you say big corporations don't need to own HBAR, they will only hold enough to meet network and cost requirements. I'm not sure that's true. Um, financial institutions could invest and hold HBAR, either directly or through an exchange traded product like an ETF, or via real world assets like uh, through Archex and security tokens, or a fund that, such as the ones that uh, Aberdeen are, have launched, a stable coin. Um, or Guardian, sustainable impact token. So there are, you know, these, these tokens, these real world asset um, tokens all drive the, the ability for institutions to invest in Hedera, the Hedera network and um, ultimately into HBAR. But for enterprise use cases too, and I think this is probably where the question came from, enterprises need to hold a treasury and they'll, they'll need to hold a treasury of HBAR to interact with the network. They won't be buying at spot market prices on you know minute by minute basis as needed. They'll buy it on a daily basis or a weekly or probably even monthly basis. And they'll they have treasury functions which do that, especially if they're, they're do, doing kind of foreign exchange um, transfers as well for multinationals. So treasury is a big, big kind of part of the, um, the kind of commercial operation of, uh, of any of these enterprises. And it will be no different for utilizing the Hedera network and, and managing their, their, their HBAR. A good corporate treasury function, which will you know, manage those, those funds appropriately, will hold a sufficient HBAR for a predictable period of time. And they may buy it spot if their cost price of the uh, of what they've got in their treasury fund or treasury pool goes up. Or if it goes down, they may use what's in the pool. They may buy and sell around the, the average price of, uh, of their, their pool, but they'll still hold funds. Now, if you expand that out to all the enterprises ultimately using Hedera, that's a lot of total value locked, a lot of HBAR held and locked, which is a, you know, a driver for price appreciation. 
So I think some of those um, those the, the bases for your um, for your question could be looked at in a different way. You also refer to native staking rewards need to be sufficient if you want the HBAR price to rise. Well, we all want native staking rewards to be you know higher than they are at the moment. And we look to other layer ones and we see far higher staking returns, but those are all unsustainable. Staking rewards in the sustain, for sustainability need not to be drawing down on the, the treasury of that network, which is what every other network's doing. You know, we started by doing that as well with, you know, with our 6.5% um, rate. But for sustainability, the algorithm, the new algorithm that was implemented last year, um, enables us to, over time, get to a uh, you know an equilibrium of network fees coming in. Ten percent of all network fees go into the account, which is then distributed um, as native staking rewards. There are other ways of getting rewards, of course, from the network and you know through some of our DeFi ecosystem partners, et cetera, et cetera. But from a native staking perspective, these networks have to be sustainable, and ultimately, the treasuries of the other layer ones will get depleted. And you know the uh, the rewards will drop off a cliff anyway. When the Hedera Governing Council determined its new strategy for for native staking, it wanted it to be sustainable, but it also wanted it to be automatic. So it doesn't need human intervention. It doesn't require you know individuals or, or small groups of people to come and sign you know transactions in order that that changes. So it's automatic. It's transparent, right? So the community knows that the automatic um, algorithm, um, what it is, <clears throat> and can make their own predictions in terms of the the staking rewards that they'll be getting. And finally, no surprises, right? This is all about you know sort of a long term growth strategy. You know, we, we we would all prefer it to be higher, but at least we know what it's going to be, and we can build it into our own. Um, strategies for where we stake and 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 what we do with the HBAR now in our accounts and wallets. And I also want to address, he said, that he, it scares him that there is the potential for increasing supply. Now, on mm. all of these networks, Bitcoin included, there are mechanisms that you can actually change supply. But I think Hedera has the strongest things preventing changes in supply, including burning. So adding supply and reducing supply. So Hedera would require a complete council member vote, a unanimous vote of every single yep. council member on something that would be very contentious to start with. So I think that's a high bar already, but Swirls Labs, the only Hedera co governing council member that is permanent, has said that they're a permanent no vote on changing the supply of HBAR. So I think those are some of the strongest controls we could have on that. So I, I think yeah. we're in pretty good shape. We are and just a minor correction there. It's Swirls Inc., not Swirls Labs, that are the governing permanent governing council member. And yes, they have said they are a permanent no vote. So I mean, deliberately so to to provide assurance and confidence that the 50 billion tokens will be only ever 50 billion. And that is scarce, right? Uh, Peter says that um, unless it becomes a scarce resource, 50 billion is, is you know, a, a scarce resource. And as we uh, put more and more into circulation, um, the, the, the dynamics, the market dynamics uh, will, be, will be very obvious. 50 billion sounds like a big number, but bear in mind that XRP, there are 100 billion of those. Solana is unlimited and Cardano has 45 billion. So which is you know, a similar amount. Th these numbers are not, you know, from a tokenomics perspective out there, they are standard. And when you have a 100 year network with uh, use cases we cannot even begin to imagine uh, in, in 2024, then uh, 50 billion sounds like a pretty good number to me. Um, and then I think the final point and from the question when Peter says, otherwise HBAR is just a utility with no value. The va the utility is the value, right? This is, like this, is all, this, this is all about utility. And the more utility we give to the network, the more builders, the more network effect, the greater the value. That's how the HBAR token economies work. That's how all networks should work. Uh, this is the way.
Well, Rob, I, I couldn't agree more. The next one, I think, is probably in my wheelhouse, so I'll probably take it, but I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. HBARism says, low-hanging fruit. What's stopping the HBAR Foundation and others to engage with really genuine influencers like Credible Crypto, Pentoshi, and Kevin Cage? They'll do the promotion for free. You just need to engage with them. Just talk to them. They can bring thousands of new people in the Hedera ecosystem. So I agree that influencers are very important in the space. Uh, we do engage with these guys. We we engage with Ryan mm. Solomon, and I've had conversations with Credible Crypto. I know Credible Crypto just had a, an interview with Shane, the uh, CEO of the HBAR Foundation. So we do engage with them. They are also running businesses, though. And I know Zepsi, he had a, a conversation with uh, one of the influencers, and he's like, hey, this is something that's exciting that's going on in the space. And the guy sent him a, a price chart of, of what mm. um, it would cost to do a tweet or do this or do that. Um, so there are costs at times associated. The, the ones mentioned, they just you know want to engage with the Hedera community and engage with their community, letting them know everything that's happening in the space. Uh, but I don't think generally the HBAR Foundation is going to pay for influencers like that. But um, we do appreciate everything that all the different crypto influencers do in getting the word out there about what Hedera is doing. I do think that there's a, another type of thought leader that we would like to engage a little bit more. And that's ones that are more engaged on, on the entire financial scene. So uh, people like Mike Novogratz and Kathy Wood, mm. um, I think especially Kathy Wood with how focused she is on innovation, I think she would be perfect for Hedera. But this is where we get into, they need to have some skin in the game. They have mm. to have some exposure before they do the proper research. I think we've all kind of run through that as well. Until we get skin in the game, we might not dig into something as much as it might deserve. But if we can get the attention of, of people like that, I think they'll, they'll really be impressed with what they find with Hedera. Any, any thoughts, Rob? No, no, I agree. I agree entirely. Uh, the online influencers appeal to a particular demographic of, you know, as and we all know the kinds of audience that they have. So that's perfectly legitimate. The Novogratzes and, and Kathy Woods absolutely, I think, would be would be awesome um, to to have have on our side. Uh, but they're very busy they need to be attracted in some way or or, or other and um, hopefully you know the foundation and um, Hedera itself can can reach out to them we've got the opportunities of Davos coming up we've got uh, other opportunities in the very near future to grab their attention before we get into a you know a, the, uh, the the high adrenaline uh, bull market which uh, we expect to, to happen sometime this year it's getting more exciting all the time. All right. So a couple of weeks ago or several weeks ago, we were actually talking about how Hedera had open sourced the Hashgraph algorithm. And Kerry Sayer 4206 says, you didn't explore what challenges to be truly open source are. Having put source code out under the Apache license, what issues remain? So what are your thoughts there, Rob? So I, I reached out to Andrew Aitken. Uh, Hedera's uh, chief open source officer to to get his take on this question. So it's always best to, to get it from the horse's mouth. And what Andrew said was that putting software under an open source license is actually the most simple part after making sure that there are no third party dependencies or infringements. Only OSI approved open source licenses are recognized as truly legitimate. So that's the first stage. But the only real reason today to open source something is to be able to drive shared innovation, access new markets, share costs. That is the business rationale. All right, Rob, we had some technical issues, but you were talking about open source. Obviously, my camera isn't good right now. We lost my camera, but I'd like you to continue on. Great. Uh, I was saying that the, um, the business rationale for open source uh, and open sourcing software is, is way more important than the, you know, the technical dependencies and issues. And in order to accrue these benefits, you need to be a, um, able to build a vibrant, healthy community. That is, and that's the most difficult part. Um, organizations can take multiple years and spend millions of dollars. Uh, to build this kind of healthy community that provides the, the sorts of business returns that they, they may be looking for. And one way to reduce this investment and shorten that time frame is to look for existing technologically aligned communities where one can contribute code and leverage the momentum infrastructure, governance processes, and positive brand that already exists. So you know, these are the, some of the, the thoughts that 
Andrew Aiken is is having. You know, he's we've open sourced this technology, and we you know we joined the the Hyperledger Foundation, for example, um, you know, a couple of years ago, which was kind of contributed um, to and uh, without with some of our open source, but that's it sits on the shelf unless you have a vibrant community to engage and utilize it and contribute and build it out. And that's what I, Andrew's specific job is to do now is to ensure that um, the, uh, the open source gets, gets distributed and is supported and that community is grown. So um, yeah, that's what, that's what's happening right now. An important initiative for sure. All right, I have one more for you. Trainwreck at says, hey, Brandon, I have a question slash request for Rob. I haven't heard much about data on disk in the ecosystem. And to me, this seems like a huge innovation that isn't talked about. What exactly is data on disk? What are some of his thoughts about the implications and applications of it in this space? And what can it mean for tech at large? Thanks and keep up the good work. I always look forward to the work you guys do. So Rob, I actually covered data on disk at least fairly thoroughly in this space. Uh, but what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it is, a, it is a massive deal. You did a great job a few weeks ago or a month or so ago when it, when it was launched. And there's, there's plenty of material online to kind of go into some detail. We'll show some, some of the graphs here because it kind of really, that the pictures make this rather dry subject uh, spring to life. Previous to data on disk, Hedera used utilized memory. So every node has, you know, a lot, lot of computer memory and all the computations and the, you know, accounts and, you know, token um, IDs and, and everything kind of stored in that memory. And of course, over time, you have to, as we scale the network, more and more expensive computer memory would need to be deployed. And we use these Merkle tree structures, data structures that enable us to be very efficient in memory, but there, there would be a better way to kind of remove and free up the memory and move those data structures that are being held in memory to, you know, to support the computations um, onto disk. So data on disk is really the, the movement of these Merkle data structures onto I guess, solid state disk architecture within the, the nodes. What that does is it frees up memory for even greater growth. It pretty much makes the, the, the data storage unlimited because it's a lot easier to add more and more storage as, as the, the network grows. It's, it's a massive deal because, as you can see in the charts, both the, um, the memory usage and the time to write the state of the network has, has dropped significantly. And so that makes for a far more efficient network. Um, it makes for a, a network that is you know, far more scalable. It makes it a lot less expensive as we roll out to community nodes. So the hardware infrastructure um, isn't as expensive as it needs, uh, you know, it would otherwise need to be. And no other blockchain or distributed ledger has anything like this. This was a this was a world first. It took a year to design and build this um, this this move from memory to to data on disk. Some great stuff on GitHub, um, and you know, for, for the tech minded um, audience, I think it's probably worth going to to check that out because we've we've kind of transformed almost in stealth. The way that Hedera um, operates, and it's you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, testament to um, the, the the team, the engineering team at Swirls Labs, and you know, it's one of the, the the key things that they've been focusing on through the last year. It's so impressive. This and and also the new gossip protocol that dropped mm. our time to consensus finality by two seconds. These kind of improvements are, are going to keep coming because we have a really innovative team over there at Swirls Labs. But Rob, that's all we have for today. I want everybody to keep sending your questions in and we'll keep adding them to the queue and knocking them out here week in and week out. But Rob, thank you so much for showing up again and we'll see you next week. Thanks very much, Brandon. And uh, goodbye, everyone. 
So as always, keep those questions coming in. We have a pretty good queue that's getting lined up, and Rob's going to be back with us next week to continue answering your questions. Uh, all right, so the next thing we want to get into, and this goes to show again how it can take a long time to develop some of these things, but eventually it bears fruit, and it has to do with SKUX. SKUX is a coupon company that's building around Hedera, and we heard from them a couple years ago, and I'm going to get into that in a second, but they were just awarded a couple patents. And in their announcement, they say, partnered with Hashgraph, the multi-patented solution incorporates a one-way cryptographic signature, the end result of which provides a zero-knowledge proof, further mitigating payment fraud. But to explain it in a little more detail, we have a video that was admittedly from a couple years ago, but explains it really well. And it was done by John Najarian, one of my favorite people within the financial space. He always does a great job. And he was talking to uh, Bobby Tinsley of SKUX and of course our own Lehman Baird. Hello, I am John Najarian and I'm here at the NASDAQ with two very exciting companies that have a fantastic partnership that you wanna hear about. The first one is Hedera Hashgraph. HBAR is the symbol, HBAR is the token, and the founder of that and the inventor of that particular technology is Dr. Lehman Baird. Dr. Baird, great to have you here, sir. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. And next to Dr. Baird, an old friend, Bobby Tinsley. Absolutely. Bobby has been working in the space for years, and I love what you guys have been doing upending the coupon business mm. with SKUX, Bobby. Yep. Um, so tell us a little bit, Bobby, if you will, about SKUX for the viewers out here that haven't heard of SKUX. Mm. You will, folks, oh, yeah. because some of the biggest companies, some of the biggest brands are using SKUS te SKUX technology right now. So yep. tell us a little bit about how you guys have basically taken an old hundred year old business <laughs> coupons and taken it to the next level. You know. Thanks for having us again, John. So sure. when, when you look at the coupon industry, right? Mm -hmm. You look at the coupon clearinghouse was basically invented in the 1950s. Okay. This industry has not changed since that time. I mean, there's been very little innovation and it really boils down to the fact that when you look at coupons or promotional offers or rebates or settlement, it's an IOU. Mm -hmm. And when you look at SKUX, what we're doing is the literal currency versus coupon. And what does that mean? So when I talk about SKUX, it's not a coupon. And it's whether it's a digital coupon or a paper coupon, it's a product-based payment. It's a payment-based offer. So mm -hmm. SKUX, what we're doing is we're literally taking all of that inefficiency and fraud and you know boxing up of offers and tagging them and shipping them across border and all the stuff that happens in this industry. Yeah, it's amazing that we're you know living in a, a day and time of technology that's you know at our fingertips, yet we're still doing that and we're transitioning that over to the payment rails. And so what ends up happening is you get serialization, you get one-time use, you get virtually fraud-free, you get the ability to issue an offer and track it the entire life cycle. So from the issuance of that offer, all the way through redemption, all the way through settlement, and close the, the loop. Mm -hmm. And when you, you know, talk to leading brands, we work with tons of them, when you talk to retailers, when you talk to, you know, people in general today wanna track ROI. That is so important for marketing, especially in a digital environment, right? So we looked at that, and I've got other partners in SKUX that you know very well, and we came together and we said, okay, the leading minds wanna solve this problem. How do we put together a collective group with the right partners, with the right technology, mm -hmm. and really change this industry? Because at the end of the day, the fraud that's billions of dollars, guess what happens? Obviously, the brands pay for that, but the consumer gets affected because we're talking about you know, dollars that could go in consumers' pockets. Right. So we're very, very passionate about this. Now, to manage that, you have to have the right technology and you have to be able to track the supply chain of an offer, which is why we're so excited to be working with Hedera. And just, it, it's an amazing technology and it's an amazing time for retail right now. Absolutely. And Dr. Baird, um, you came up with a technology with Hedera um, that basically allows for billions of transactions. In fact, you guys run the most transactions on the networks of anybody out there right now. How did you do that? How were you able to overcome and you know, get into this business and have that kind of throughput? That's one of our favorite terms, but throughput, speed, velocity, whatever you want to call it. Oh yeah, so we have extreme speed. We have done more than a billion and a half transactions, more than any other ledger, 
Mm -hmm. And we do this, we've slowed it down to only 10,000 a second. Only the 10, current 000. limit. Uh, we'll, we'll raise that in the future. And, it, and, it, and it's not just high throughput, it's also just a few seconds till it reaches finality. And it's true finality you can trust. And it all comes down to the math. We mm -hmm. use math rather than using hard things, uh, you know, lots of electricity. We just use math instead of electricity to do these sorts of things. I think it's exciting to see that SkewX is still there and in development. You know, it's, we see time and time again, um, you know, these use cases pop up and then it takes a, you know, a while for them to come to mainnet or whatever it might be. But we know that they're building. Um, you know, I think the last time we covered them was in, what, 2021. So to know they're still out there, still pursuing patents, still fast paced as they can be, it's exciting to know that, you know, we're going to see more of these come out as we move forward. Teams we've almost forgotten about on the fringes coming back to the forefront and bringing that utility. So, you know, excited to hear that. And I'm sure getting these patents is, a, you know, a sign of things to come, definitely. So, Zepp, I do want to take one of our hard left turns. Last week, we talked an awful lot about DeFi. We talked about our HTS and HBAR economy and ecosystem. The next guest that I have, I had some conversations with, and his insights around this space is invaluable. So I wanted to make sure to get him on so everybody else could hear what he had to say as well. Uh, but I do want to say we are going to be talking about meme coins here. Warlock would be one of the first ones to admit that um, it, it's just gambling, right? Even though he's one of the creators of uh, one of our most popular meme coins, he he understands that this is a way to build community, to bring people into the Hedera ecosystem. But of course, this is a, a good place to say this is not financial advice. But again, he has some great insights So listen in. Today, we welcome the creator of one of Hedera's most popular coins, as well as the voice of SaucerSwap, to talk about the Hedera token economy. Warlock, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, should I maybe beef up my voice to sound more impressive? Some people <laughs> who know I do voice work, or they find out I do voice work, are like, you? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bit of a higher register, I'd say, for most people. Give us a little They're... bit of growth. Just a little bit. Hey everybody, Gerbert the Grouse here, and I'm just so happy to finally be on the H-Bar Bowl. Good stuff, but <laughs> you have a lot of serious stuff that you're doing as well, and I think you have some really good opinions. So what are your thoughts about where the H-Bar and HTS economy stands as of this moment? So we are doing super well. If you compare us to other chains, there's over $60 million in TVL and SaucerWap right now. And we don't have a bunch of things that other ecosystems have, and, and we're absolutely killing it. Uh, a lot of activity with uh, Karate, Galaxy, a lot of HDS tokens doing really well. Obviously, meme tokens popping off again. What's so exciting about this is this means more people are using the Hedera network. They are, have, and I've observed this, lots of new people coming in. And what I've always said is, is kind of a secondary mission statement with Guelph is uh, the best thing you can do to get someone to love Hedera is have someone use Hedera. And buying a token on SaucerSwap is the simplest way to be like, oh, wow, this is really fast. This is really cheap. There's not a long process of onboarding. There's not a long YouTube deep dive you have to listen to. Like it's just apparent as soon as you interact with our network, how good it is and, and people stay. And we're seeing that. That's one thing that, you know, we have Saucer Swap who has absolutely become the champion because of many different things that they're doing well. But we're starting to see some, some competition. Of course, we have the H suites out there. We have Hell Swap and so forth. And, and that little bit of competition, I think, is going to be good. And the way H suite does things differently, I think that's beneficial as well. But there's no question that Saucer Swap is a fantastic user experience uh, just in general. But what do you think this all means for DeFi, Hedera DeFi in 2024? So if you look at where we are, uh, in comparison to other networks who have expanded their DeFi, it's it's our time. This is the time where we're going to be seeing some new stuff come online. I'm thinking lending, borrowing, derivatives. 2024, I think, will be the expansion of DeFi services on Hedera. And what's really exciting about that, not just, oh, there's more stuff to do on Hedera, um, but that's a major, major draw for people on other networks to come here. When new stuff comes online on a network, when a lending protocol launches on a network, there's always a huge amount of excitement and there's always a lot of press that goes out. It's, it's, a, it's a great moment to show their stuff happening. You know, uh, we've had all these different swaps launch, but, you know, they've launched and it's a lot harder to market and do outreach for something that's there and has been there. 
So getting new services, expanding DeFi is something that I think it's going to be our year to make that transition, uh, expand in that way for Hedera in 2024. And I'm really excited for it, uh, especially this pivot towards uh, retail that I seem to be seeing, uh, more focus on retail, caring about retail more uh, is something that a lot of people have been wanting to see. And, and I've been seeing uh, the, the beginnings of that, and I'm really excited about it. So what are some examples of that, of where you see the, the shift towards the focus on retail? The recent, please check it out. I think I made a tweet about it. The recent HBAR Foundation Twitter space uh, with Shane and Lane, they talked about it a lot and they were very clear that uh, retail is something they're going to be looking at more. And I, I don't think that's something isolated to the HBAR Foundation um, with, with our boy Charles coming in. Uh, I think a lot of these things and the way he talks about it, I think he was talking about, you know, further reiterating that the world's going to be tokenized, which is something I firmly believe in. I think a lot of these these statements that have been coming out uh, show that they're hearing us. They're hearing the Hedera community that we want to see more retail stuff. You don't need to go full degen, even though that would be very funny. Um, we are still uh, an enterprise chain that focuses on serious use cases, but there isn't a reason we can't do both. Uh, we are beefy enough, we're strong enough, and We've got a really, really dedicated and, and close-knit community, which is something that is going to be really valuable as we transition into this expansion of DeFi. Uh, Hashback, for instance, getting more features every week, getting great updates. They even released a token creator uh, a week or two ago. Anybody who has the wallet can make a token within seconds. Uh, I think I, I was messing around with it. It cost me 10 HR. <laughs> to make your so if you just think about bringing that power to the people, uh, they're, they're really doing it well. Uh, Saucer Swap's doing it well. Everybody knows each other. Everybody works with each other. Um, so it's it's we've got such a solid foundation for 2024 that it's it's going to be nuts. And what do you think about, you know, you mentioned some of the tokens that we have. What do you think of the mix of the tokens we have? We have sports tokens. We have social media tokens. We have meme coins and so forth. What, what do you think about how we're doing as, as far as the range of tokens we have? I would say that when things really get cooking, it is going to be... <laughs> There is going to be a even broader range. I saw we had like a diamond authentication Carrot. token that From came diamond as well. Standard. Yeah, serious company. Right. Uh, I think that kind of stuff, the range is going to broaden and broaden and broaden um, because I think it, it will be a tokenized future. I think what Patches is doing with HTS20, kind of a stripped down version where you can't make a liquidity pool with it, but it's it's like point allocation. I think that's really interesting. I don't have a big enough brain to fully understand all of it, but we're just going to see an even broader, broader range than we have already. Um, but I, I'm happy with how broad it is right now. And I'm excited to see some of the gaming tokens to come into the, the ecosystem as well. So now I'm the first to admit that I don't normally degen into meme coins. I do get some exposure, but I really appreciate your philosophy in creating Grelf. And you kind of touched on this a little bit, but can you remind us why you created this ugly little guy and give us a, a general update? So, you know, my baby boy, who I love, uh, uh, I created as as an anti mascot. I just thought it would be really funny to just make the just most unappealing guy possible and make that a mascot. Uh, and and once I got into it, uh, it became this guy stands out. Uh, people for some reason, for whatever reason, seem to gravitate towards him. Um, what a perfect opportunity to get people to quickly interact with and use the Hedera network. Uh, meme coins are great for grabbing attention. They're great for, believe it or not, a, a lot of motivation for people interacting with crypto is greed, uh, is is wanting to get a quick return on something with not much effort. Uh, meme coins being a big center of that, uh, which is why they're very successful uh, in getting attention. Um, and once someone interacts with this weird guy, uh, clicks that icon, does something with it. They see, wow, okay, this place is different and, and they want to stay here with us. There you go. Well, we appreciate everything that you do in the space and for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So it's great to hear from Warlock as always. You know, he's a key community contributor. You know, he's been around for a while and you know, he, he really cares about the hash graph, the tech, but also the fun and the community aspect. You know, if you ever want to talk to him, he's very, very active in the Discord, you know, in Club H Bar, but he's also got his, you know, personal account you can DM. But this week we saw that a new source and growth farm has also arisen on Saucer Swap. The two teams there are in close contact. So there's a lot more energy coming into that side of the ecosystem, you know. And that's great to see. You mentioned that, you know, it is inherently a sort of gamble, you know, again, not financial advice. 
But when you see the likes, you know, Emin from, from Avalanche, you know, coming out and saying they're going as far as investing in the meme coins as part of their culture fund, there is a lot of energy there. And it, it is a part of Web3 that is definitely here to stay. So the source, source swap new pair is there, you know, Warlocks and Discord. And one other thing that he actually mentioned was that the, the new Hashpack token creator. And I think this is core, you know, to our token economy, core to improving that user experience across our Hashgraph ecosystem, our Hedera ecosystem as a whole. And it really opens the door for more people to come in and, you know, play around with the technology and, you know, enter the DeFi economy or spin up their own, whatever it might be on the network. It really reduces that barrier. So excited to see Hashpack with that new innovation, definitely. Yeah, I agree with that. And Blade, one of our other wallets in the ecosystem, has some stuff to share as well. Yeah, so Blade came out with their own Blade Launchpad as well. You know, Blade and Hashpack are two of our leading wallets. They've got to stay competitive with each other. And so they both have this, this new utility. And it's really exciting to see them both pursuing that from different angles at a time where our DeFi economy is definitely getting more excited. So whether you're a Blade bro or a Hashpack bro, there's, uh, you know, you can you can spin up whatever you want in, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. It's a, it's a real, real new innovation though. Yeah, that competition between the wallets is invaluable. You can't just have one player or they're just going to stagnate. And we're seeing the same thing with, um, you know, our, our DeFi, our DEXs, right? So Saucer Swap has competition, always has had competition from Hella Swap at least a few months after Saucer Swap launched. And we should have a conversation with H Suite within the next few weeks. So that should be good as well. And Zep, with that, we're going to shift gears again. We're going to get into the big story in the crypto ecosystem this week. And that was the, the Bitcoin ETFs. So we saw a lot of success. I think they had $4.6 billion worth of volume across all the different ETFs on the very first day. We're going to see how that develops in the weeks to come. But we also wanted to get some commentary from the chief legal officer at the HBAR Foundation. He had some really good insights on the, the regulatory and, and legal ramifications of what we heard this week. A few months ago, we had George, the chief legal officer at the HBAR Foundation, on to talk about the GBTC Bitcoin Trust conversion to an ETF ruling, which, of course, the SEC had been fighting tooth and nail. Now, that case was found in favor of Bitcoin ETFs, but... At the time, there was still a lot of uncertainty. So yesterday marked the result of that ruling with 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs being approved. And we welcome George back to give us some quick insights. Uh, George, thanks for stopping by. Hey, Brandon. Thanks, thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, sure. So we'll jump right into it. From a legal and regulatory perspective, what does yesterday's approval mean for the crypto industry at large? Well, yesterday's approval, it's huge. There, like you mentioned, there was some uncertainty following the court ruling that said that the SEC was act arbitrarily and capricious with regard to denying Bitcoin spot market ETF. The uncertainty came with the fact that the SEC wasn't forced to approve the, the spot market ETFs. Instead, they could have revoked the approval of the uh, futures Bitcoin ETFs and therefore complied with the court order in that sense, but they didn't. So now we finally got approval of the Bitcoin spot market ETFs. The re retail and institutional investors now have a new way to get exposure to the to the industry, uh, and I think it's uh, it paves the way for more maturing of the industry. So, looking out to the future, what's the next thing on the regulatory, legislative, or judicial fronts we should be paying attention to? Yeah, I think we're, uh, a lot of attention is going to stay on the uh, ETFs, and the question is going to turn to whether or not we'll see more ETFs approved with regards, to, for example, like Ether or XRP, where those are two assets that have more regulatory clarity around them. We're still far out from getting those assets, getting those approved. But uh, one thing that Gensler came straight out and said almost immediately after the approval of the Bitcoin spot market ETFs was uh, he put out a quote, something to the effect of like, this is not the floodgates opening. This does not mean that the crypto assets are now fair game for all ETFs. And he mentioned kind of crypto security. So he's still implying that since he thinks that everything other than Bitcoin is a security, it doesn't look like there's a clear path, but we'll see. I think we have a decision on the Ether spot market ETFs coming in, up in May. So that's we won't have to wait too long for that. Uh, but I'm hopeful that we'll get some more action there. Now, still, that all being said, 
things have changed from the beginning of last year. Things at the beginning of last year looked pretty ugly. We had a very good trend in general when it comes to rulings and, you know, the reg regulatory landscape here in the United States. Plus, overseas, internationally, we're seeing much more favorable environments. What do you think about that trend of things looking better for the crypto industry, not just in the United States, but more broadly internationally? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we were slammed by a lot of negative news coming out from the industry, right? We had the SBF, a lot of negative press coming out of that, which really put a dark cloud over the industry. But I think that cloud has now uh, moved on. And now we're getting a lot of, like you said, favorable rulings. Things are coming out in our, in, in our favor, not only in the U.S., but internationally. I think we have the wind in our sails uh, now, and I think it'll just keep moving that way. Yeah, things are looking brighter every day. Uh, George, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for stopping by. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for all you do, Brand. It's great to hear uh, George's view there. And we're, we're lucky to have someone with such a wide grasp of Web3 and Web2 and you know the legal barriers between them both on our side. And I think something really interesting or exciting about it is that whilst the US is, you know, they're, they're, they're remaining kind of closed to other crypto assets at the moment, this definitely seems like the floodgate. And ironically, the US is now one of the best places to get exposure to crypto through traditional financial instruments. A Bitcoin ETF at the heart of some of the biggest you know, investment banks that they have there, opening that door to traditional investors. You know, whilst it's only Bitcoin at the moment, you know, that's the one that they're certain isn't a security. It's not uh, hard to envision a future whereby other assets come into those ETFs and the US becomes a much better place for traditional or traditional finance to get involved in crypto. So exciting that we've crossed that first hurdle and I'm sure there's a lot more to come. Yeah, for sure. Now, Zepp, you mentioned last week the HCS20 standard and, and we've seen it get some traction lately. So did you have any comments on that? Yeah, so H HCS20, you know, is our answer to, to, to ordinals or inscriptions. And, you know, Avalanche have their own standard, you know, uh, Solana have their own and so on and so forth. But the most interesting thing is that when these other chains, particularly Avalanche, have set up their own standard of BRC20, they've been met with you know, increasing gas fees for relatively little transactions, congestion and so on and so forth. In fact, I think it was about 8 million transactions that pushed the Avalanche transaction fees up a pretty substantial level, whereby on Hedera we reached sort of 11 and a half million two days ago, we were seeing sort of 40 to 400 TPS, I believe that, um, you know, patches said at one point, of course, we didn't break a sweat. So again, a testament there to the efficiency of Hedera. Um, and hopefully other people will start to see that from other other chains. Yeah, well, at Mayo is, is taking a break and tweaking some things, getting ready to come back. It's good that uh, we're adding some TPS through HCS20 standard. All right, Alvarium is the other thing that I saw this week that I wanted to get into, and you had some information on that as well. Yeah, so I don't have too much information at this point in time, but I, I did see that Matt Yarger, who's from Demia, you know, part of the IOTA Foundation originally, he's come out again this week saying that, you know, there's a lot of work going on with Dell, with Project Alvarium, and a lot of new work going on connecting the IOTA capabilities, which are part of Project Alvarium, to Hedera with the Sustainable Impact Fund at the foundation. So, you know, it's great to know that a lot is going on behind the scenes since that announcement and that Dell is coming closer to our ecosystem as a, a governing council member. You know, we've seen that edge computing white paper of theirs. We've seen them talk about this a lot in the past. So to have them pursuing that on Hedera is definitely exciting. And I did get in touch with Matt, and I think in two weeks we'll have an interview with him. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting some more information, considering some of those big names that they have going on. And with that, we'll go ahead and get into some network analysis. Besides a spike a few days ago, we remained in a transaction volume lull for most of the week. But at the time of recording, we are starting to see some life with the Hedera network processing about 400 transactions per second. If past trends hold, we may see this increase continue to a new all-time high, or it may be a fake out like we saw earlier this week. Still, we managed to see a peak of just under 4,000 transactions per second. We also saw about 11,000 accounts added to mainnet this week and an average time to consensus finality of just 3.3 seconds. Looking at our fungible tokens, Wrapped HBAR and Sauce take the top spots, followed by the Hedera native version of USDC and the meme coin Unlucky. I got it right this time, guys. 
Next up, we have Energy Trade Token, H Suite, XSauce, Dovu, Bridged USDC, and the Meme Coin Zero. The NFT front is still dominated by the Rant CPU NFTs we discussed earlier, followed by the Liquidity Provider NFT from SaucerSwap. We then have a couple Karate Combat themed Karateka NFTs, the Mobile Game Slime World NFT, then one I haven't seen yet called Coin and Gem, and finally an H Suite Liquidity Provider NFT to round out the top 10. And with that, we'll go ahead and move on to some DeFi. Taking a look at DeFi Llama, not including state or liquid staking, the TVL for the Hedera DeFi ecosystem has gone up a bit over the last week to over $74 million, despite HBAR being down. SaucerSwap makes up over $70 million of that, and HellSwap makes up most of the balance. Still, we need to see HSuite on here somehow. I also see DaVinci Graph on there, which isn't a traditional DEX, but I don't have a full understanding of their scope quite yet, so I'm going to try to get some more information. Taking a look at some of the staking rewards on SaucerSwap's popular trading pairs, HBAR HBAR X version 1 is at 4.4%, HBAR Sauce V1 is at 17%, V2 at 52%, HBAR USDC V1 is at 34%, V2 at 106%, and finally HBAR Karate is at 52%. Over on Heliswap, HBAR Heli is at 125%, 20% on HBAR USDC, and 28% on HBAR Karate. Risk assets took a hit on Thursday as a hotter inflation print than expected might imply rate cuts are less likely than many had hoped. Crypto markets shrugged this off on Thursday as the ETF launched, but dropped significantly on Friday. I'm not sure if this drop is crypto catching down to the broader markets or if some of the ETF buy the rumor sell the fact I admittedly didn't buy into has started to kick in. Bitcoin is down slightly on the day, but nearly 7% on the week. At the time of recording, HBAR is sitting at 8.1 cents, down 4.5% on the day and 2.5% on the week. We tested support at 8 cents, which besides a spike low held, but we're close. And 8.5 cents is the next area of resistance. All right, Zep, that's pretty much all we have. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on? Yeah, I think obviously it was, a, it was another big week for institutions. You know, we saw Google as a governing council member, you know, go into Novik Tech or Timeless, however you want to call it, as builders on the Hedera Guardian and propel that Hedera Guardian forward with this credibility that goes beyond credits, it goes beyond cloud services. This is a real testament, a real showcase of the Hedera Guardian. Alongside this Google support, we've got Hedera at Davos, you know, we've got the governing council teams, we've got Charles as the as the president, we've got, you know, some massive, massive speakers coming in. And really, I'd like to see that Hedera is there once more shown as this leading ledger for institutions. That's what Max has repeatedly called, you know, the center of the world for these the next couple of weeks. So we're going to have a big, big influx of eyes and hopefully, you know, business development opportunities coming into Hedera through there. But not only have we got those big institutional developments, we've seen, you know, the coming together of two layer ones, which is sort of unprecedented in, in Web3, really. And to have them teaming together, you know, Sylvia McKelly is a massive mind in Web3, you know, invented zero knowledge proofs. You know, the CTO, John Woods, is, is a massive supporter, you know, a very, very clever dude within their ecosystem. And of course, Lehman there is our own flagship genius. So it's... Uh, to have them all together pursuing that end goal of mass adoption via, you know, less friction through an improved UX in terms of private keys, that is a potential landslide moment for Web3. And hopefully more and more institutions, more blockchains, more banks will come in to support that. And, you know, that'll be Lehman's time in the sun. So exciting week all around, definitely. I think it's not just going to be that. This might be what starts it off, but I think uh, Lehman will be acknowledged for you know his genius around creating the hash graph once, once we really start to catch fire. But next week, I'm definitely looking forward to Davos, seeing what comes out around that. I would love to see a council member get announced, but I'm sure either way, it's going to be a pretty good event to watch for Hedarians. I also have some really exciting interviews coming up. I have Zenny that we should have next week. We should have HSuite, as I mentioned, and I'm working on a couple other ones. We should get Matt, who was associated with Alvarium, which we talked about. And of course, we're going to get Rob Allen back next week. So make sure you drop those questions down in the comments. That's all we have. We'll see you next week.